The Tears of Princess Brunella from The Other Side of the Sun storybook by Evelyn Sharp. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Blakeney Clark. There is no doubt that Princess Brunella would have been the most charming little girl on either side of the sun if she had not been so exceedingly cross and discontented. She was as pretty as anyone could wish to see, and as accomplished as all the gifts of fairyland could make her, and she had every bit of happiness that the love of her parents and the wit of her fairy godmother could put in her way, and yet she grumbled and grumbled and grumbled. "'Can you not try to be happy, just for five minutes?' asked the Queen in despair. "'How can you expect me to be happy, even for five minutes, when every five minutes is exactly like the last five minutes?' sighed the little princess. "'It is tea-time, your highness,' said the head nurse coaxingly, "'and there are pink sugar-cakes for tea.' "'There were pink sugar-cakes yesterday,' pouted the princess. "'There are always pink sugar-cakes, unless there are white sugar-cakes, "'and I am equally tired of them both. "'Can you not tell me something new?' "'Let her go without her tea,' said the king, "'who was rather tired of having such a cross little daughter. "'But the queen only smiled.' "'The child wants a change,' she remarked. "'It must be very dull to play all alone all day.' "'Dull?' exclaimed the king. "'Why should it be dull? "'Has not her godmother given her such wonderful toys "'that they can play with her as well as be played with?' "'This was quite true, "'for the very ball that the princess threw to one end of the nursery "'could catch itself and throw itself back to her, "'and it is not every ball that can do that.' "'What more can a child want?' demanded the king crossly. The queen, however, thought there might be something more. "'We must find her a playfellow,' she said wisely. "'Stuff and nonsense!' protested the king. "'And why should we bring more crying children into the palace? "'However, you must do as you like, I suppose.' The king always told the queen to do as she liked when he was tired of the conversation. So the queen smiled again and issued a proclamation at once to tell the whole world that the Princess Prunella wanted someone to play with and would be ready to choose a playfellow that day week at twelve o'clock in the morning. Now it is not often that one gets a chance of playing with a king's daughter, so it is no wonder that, when the princess followed her royal parents into the great hall on the appointed day, she found it filled from end to end with all the little princes and princesses, and all the little counts and countesses, and all the little dukes and duchesses that the surrounding kingdoms could produce. "'I never had a more excellent idea,' said the Queen, as she seated herself on the throne and looked down at the crowd of children. "'Prunella has talked of nothing else for a week, and she has not been heard to grumble once.' "'That's all very well,' observed the King a little uneasily. "'But it is quite clear that she cannot play with them all, and who knows that so much disappointment will not lead to a war?' The Queen did not answer, but turned to her little daughter, who stood by her side. "'Do not be in a hurry,' she said to her. So many faces are confusing at first, and you might regret it afterwards if you made a mistake. But Princess Prunella showed no signs of being in a hurry. She just glanced over the sea of faces that were turned towards her, and then looked speechlessly at her mother. The smiles had all gone from her face, and the big blue eyes were filled with tears. "'Why, they are all exactly alike,' she said piteously. "'I cannot tell one from another.' And then, to the astonishment of everyone in the room, she dropped down on the steps of the throne and began to cry. "'Dear, dear, what is to be done?' exclaimed the Queen in much alarm. "'It will look so very bad if all the children have to be sent home again.' "'It will certainly lead to a war,' was all the King said. And then they both looked helplessly at their sobbing little daughter. As for all the children, they were so surprised at hearing how much alike that they were, they said nothing at all and it is difficult to tell what would have been the end of the matter if the princess had not suddenly jumped to her feet and pointed towards the door. "'There is the prince I should like to play with,' she exclaimed. "'He is not like the others, for he has a wonderful look on his face.' Everybody looked round at the doorway, and sure enough, there stood a boy whom no one had noticed before. "'Come here, prince,' commanded the princess, raising her voice haughtily. "'You may kiss my hand, if you like.' But the boy drew back with a bewildered air and shook his head. Princess Brunella stamped her foot angrily. "'How dare you hesitate when I tell you to come here!' she cried. At this, however, the strange boy turned and hastened out of the room altogether, and a loud murmur of astonishment rose from the children. The king's daughter had never been disobeyed in her life before, and for a moment she was too astonished to speak. "'Who is 
he? What is his name? she demanded at last. There was a pause, broken presently by the shrill voice of one of the pages. Uh, please, your highness, it is only deaf Robert, the minstrel's son, he said. Deaf? repeated the princess. What is that? It means that he cannot hear anything, little daughter, explained the queen. So, you see, he would not do for a playfellow at all. Besides, he is not even a prince. Can you not choose one of the others instead? The princess, however, could do nothing of the kind. All these are alike, she said again, but the minstrel's son had a wonderful look on his face, and I will have no one else for a playfellow. So all the children went sadly back to their homes, and wondered why they were so much alike, and the whole court was made uncomfortable once more by the sulkiness of Princess Prunella. Your Highness's best wax doll has not been out for two whole days, suggested the head nurse. The princess snatched the doll from her hands and threw it on the floor. If you will not let me play with the boy who is deaf, how can you expect me to play with a doll? she asked. And although, no doubt, there was much in what she said, it was hardly the way in which to speak to the head nurse. Indeed, there would have been a serious disturbance in the royal nursery that very next minute if the princess's cream-coloured pony had not suddenly trotted round the stable of its own accord and put it into her head to go for a ride. Now, the princess's pony was in fact a fairy pony, so when he ran away with her in the forest that day, it was not to be supposed that he would run away with her for nothing. He took her, in fact, for a real fairy ride, all through a fairy forest that began by being quite a baby forest and then grew and grew the deeper she went into it until it ended up being quite a grown-up forest. And the pony never stopped running away until he reached a dear little grey house that was set in the brightest of flower gardens right in the middle of the forest. The princess slipped off his back and pushed open a little gate and walked into the flower garden. Anyone else might have been surprised to find Jeff Robert sitting there in the middle of the trim green lawn, but after a fairy ride, one is never surprised at anything, so the princess's heart just gave one big jump for joy, and she ran straight up to him and took his hand. "'Poor deaf boy! Poor deaf boy!' she said softly. Certainly she was not behaving like a king's daughter, for she ought to have been extremely angry with him for disobeying her in the morning, instead of which she spoke as gently to him as any ordinary little girl might have done, but then... As he could not hear what she said to him, what was the use of speaking like a princess? Poor deaf boy, she repeated, bending over him. No wonder you look so dull and unhappy. It was the first time in her life that she had forgotten she was a princess, and she was quite surprised at the gentleness of her own voice. She was still more surprised when the deaf boy rose to his feet and bowed very low and answered her. I was only unhappy, princess, because I could not hear what you said to me this morning, he exclaimed. Oh? cried the princess. You can hear me now. Ah, yes, said deaf Robert. I can hear you now, because you speak so kindly. It is only when people are angry and speak roughly that I cannot hear them. That is why they say I am deaf. Have you always been deaf? asked the princess, wondering. Ever since the wimps came to my christening, answered the minstrel's son, for when they asked my father what gifts he would choose for me, he chose that I should be deaf to every sound that was not beautiful. "'So that is why you have such a wonderful look in your face,' said Princess Prunella. "'I wish the wimps went to everyone's christening.' Deaf Robert shook his head. "'If they had not come to mine,' he remarked, "'I should have been able to hear what you said this morning.' "'Never mind,' said the princess. "'Come back to the palace with me now. "'I will never speak crossly to you again, "'and then you will always be able to hear what I say.' "'No, no,' answered Robert, shrinking away. I cannot come to the town. It is so silent there. It frightens me. Silent? echoed the princess. Surely it is a forest that is silent. Oh no, said the minstrel's son, smiling. The forest is full of sound. Can you not hear them all talking? The bees and the flowers and the great pine trees? Princess Brunella listened. No, she said, shaking her head. I can hear nothing. Then she took the deaf boy's hands and pulled him towards the gate. "'Come back to the town with me,' she said eagerly. "'It is true that you cannot hear the other people's voices, but you will always be able to hear me, and that is ever so much more important.' So the minstrel's son went back to the palace with Princess Prunella, and when the king and queen saw how happy their little daughter was at last, they said nothing more about deaf Robert not being a prince, but got over the difficulty by making him a marquee on the spot, and giving him the appointment of play in chief to her royal highness. 
a magnificent banquet was given to celebrate this important event, in which several speeches were made by the king, and several tunes were played by the band. But as the speeches were exceedingly pompous, and the tunes were exceedingly noisy, the new marquis, for whom they were intended, heard neither one nor the other. However, he heard every word that the little princess whispered in his ear, and perhaps that was all he wished to hear. Never had life passed so peacefully at the palace in the days that followed. The princess was never heard to utter an angry word, and she went about with a contented look on her face that cheered the hearts of all who knew her. It was indeed a happy day for the court when the minstrel's son came to play with the king's daughter, and everyone rejoiced that the king and queen had been wise enough to let their little daughter have her own way. But all this, while no one thought of the minstrel's son. Now, anybody might suppose that a minstrel's son, who suddenly found himself made into a marquis and playfellow-in-chief to a princess, would be the happiest boy in the world. And yet, although he grew fonder every day of his little playfellow, dear Robert was the saddest person in the whole court. He grew more and more silent as the days went on, until at last even the princess noticed that he was changed. "'The wonderful look has gone from your face,' she said to him. "'Can it be that you do not feel happy at court?' Then the boy Marquis told her the truth. "'I am unhappy because I cannot hear the sounds of the town,' he said. "'Will not your father go and live in the forest for a change, "'so that we may play there instead of in this horrible, silent place?' "'But I don't want to go and play in the forest,' objected the princess. "'There are no people in the forest, "'and I should forget that I was a person myself "'if I had nothing to talk to but flowers and trees.' "'For the first time since they played together, "'deaf Robert remembered he was nearly two years older than the little princess, "'and he smiled in a superior manner. "'That is only because you hear all the wrong things,' he said. "'If you could once hear the sounds of the forest, "'you would never want to go back to the town.' "'The princess turned red with anger, "'and she opened her mouth to give the minstrel's son a thorough good scolding, "'which would certainly have surprised him had he been able to hear it. "'But she remembered in time that he would not have been able to hear it. "'So she sighed impatiently and answered him as softly as she could. "'You are quite mistaken,' she said, putting her chin in the air. "'If you were a real boy, you would understand.' "'And with that she turned and left him. "'It was certainly annoying not to be able to lose her temper whenever she felt inclined, "'but there was nothing to prevent her from remembering that she was a princess. "'That afternoon the princess pricked her finger, "'and the minstrel's son found out what she had said was quite true, "'and he was not a royal boy at all.' for of course the princess did what any other little girl of twelve years old would have done and burst into tears while the minstrel's son who was quite unable to hear her sobs only stared at her solemnly and wondered why her pretty round face had suddenly twisted into such a strange expression what are you doing prunella he asked her gravely doing wept the princess why i am crying of course that is what you would be doing if you had pricked your finger as badly as i have she held out her small white finger as she spoke, but the minstrel's son only stared at her as solemnly as before. "'Crying? What is that?' he asked. "'And why should you do anything so useless? Surely it would be better to fetch a doctor, or a piece of sticking plaster.' Princess Brunella came to the end of her patience. It had been bad enough to exist for six whole weeks without being allowed to lose her temper once, but now that she found she could not even cry with any pleasure, she felt it was more than any little girl of twelve years could be expected to bear. "'It isn't a sticking plaster that I want,' she said miserably. "'When people cry, they want to be comforted, of course.' "'Do they?' said deaf Robert, looking perplexed. "'But if I cannot hear you cry, how am I to comfort you?' The princess was far too cross to be reasonable, although she managed to remember it was no use letting her crossness appear in her voice. "'That's just it,' she sobbed. "'You ought to be able to hear me cry, and then you would be a real boy.' And the princess pitied herself so much for being forced to play with someone who was not real that she buried her face in her hands and wept more than ever. She half hoped, even then, that deaf Robert would come and kiss her and make friends again as any nice boy would have done at once, but deaf Robert did nothing of the kind, and when she at last took her hands from her eyes, her playfellow was gone. Truly, the forest had never looked so beautiful as on that day that the minstrel's son hastened through it on his way to his old home. The flowers looked their best, and the birds sang their merriest, and the trees bent their greenest boughs to give him welcome. 
but the boy with the wonderful look on his face, who had lived among them for so long, never paused so much to glance at them, and they only had time to notice as he passed by that the wonderful look was no longer there. On he hurried until he came to the little grey house, set in the garden of bright-coloured flowers, and he pushed open the gate and walked in, just as his princess had done six weeks ago. The minstrel was at home this time, and he was sitting on the doorstep in the sunshine. He had just composed a new song, and that always made him extremely happy, but he sighed a little when he saw his son come into the gate, for he had no difficulty in seeing that the wonderful look had gone from the boy's face. "'What is the matter, my son?' he said anxiously. Dear Robert wasted no time in greeting him. "'Father!' he cried. "'Why did you ask the wymps to be in my christening?' "'That is easily answered.' said the minstrel soothingly. It was because I wished you to hear nothing but beautiful sounds all your life. But what sounds do you call beautiful? demanded his son. The minstrel sighed. Can you not hear my music? he asked. Yes, yes, said deaf Robert. But what else? It had never struck the minstrel that there need be anything else, and he hesitated a little. Well, he said at last, can you not hear the sounds of the forest? Deaf Robert looked up at the pine trees overhead and down to the flowers at his feet. I used to be able to, he said sadly, but even the forest has grown silent now. Then he clenched his fists and looked imploringly at his father. Must I live to the end of my days without hearing any of the things that other boys hear? he cried. You are a little unreasonable, my son, said the minstrel. Are not the beautiful sounds of life enough for you? Enough? said deaf Robert. I want much, much more than that, father. Why, I want to hear the princess cry. That is nonsense, exclaimed the minstrel. Tears make a most unpleasant noise, and you would be extremely disappointed if you were to hear the princess cry. The minstrel's son drew himself up proudly. You do not understand. You are not real either, he said. The tears of my princess make the sweetest sound in the world, and I am not going to rest until I learn to hear it. Then he turned and walked through the gate and out of the forest once more. The minstrel looked after him and sighed. It was the best gift I could think of, he murmured. It was the one I would have chosen for myself. It is true, he added thoughtfully, that I never wanted to play with the king's daughter. The minstrel's son wandered aimlessly through the forest, the forest that he had once liked so well because it was all his, and that he only liked now because he had found his little princess in it and there he might have been wandering still if he had not met a wimp. This was not really surprising in that particular forest, for it was just the kind of forest in which any boy of fourteen might at any moment meet a wimp, but for all that, deaf Robert was just a little bit startled when the wimp suddenly dropped into his path from a tree above and nodded at him. Hello, said the wimp. What is the matter with you? I am very unhappy, because I am not a real boy, exclaimed deaf Robert. "'Dear me, how is that?' asked the wimp, pretending to be surprised. "'Well, you ought to know,' answered deaf Robert. "'It is all because the wimps came to my christening.' "'Nothing of the thought,' cried the wimp indignantly. "'It is all because your father insisted on knowing better than we did, "'and we let him have his own way. "'If the wimps had been at your christening, "'we would not even want to be a real boy. "'So you cannot hear the princess cry, eh? "'That's a good wimpish joke, that is.' and the wimp stood on his head and choked with laughter. "'It is all very well for you to laugh,' complained the minstrel's son. "'You don't know how unpleasant it is to be a boy without being a real boy.' The wimp came down on his toes again and stopped laughing. "'Then why don't you go and learn to be a real boy again?' he asked in surprise. "'How can I find out the way?' asked deaf Robert. "'You ridiculous boy!' exclaimed the wimp. "'Why, the first person you meet will be able to tell you that!' Deaf Robert had no time to thank him for his information, for the wimp began turning somersaults the moment he finished speaking, and he went on turning them until he had turned into nothing at all, and there was no more wimp to be seen. Then the minstrel's son walked on through the forest, and for three days and three nights he met no one at all. But on the morning of the fourth day he came to the very edge of the forest, and there he saw an old woman sitting by the side of a blackberry bush. Hurrah! cried Deaf Robert, waving his cap. Do you know that you are the first person I have met, and that you are going to tell me how to become a real boy? 
I will tell you at once, said the old woman, smiling, for you come straight to the point and do not beat about the bush. This is what you must do, then. Something brave and something kind and something foolish and something wise. If you are not a real boy after that, it will be your own fault. Then she walked round the blackberry bush and disappeared. And although deaf Robert forgot what she had just said about him and beat about the bush in good earnest, he never saw any more of her. Then the minstrel's son walked straight on in search of the brave deed to do, and this did not take him long, for there are always plenty of brave deeds waiting to be done by someone. So, long before the sun was above his head that day, he came to a castle where a beautiful princess was being kept captive by a cruel old giant, all because he was cruel, and for no other reason at all. And when deaf Robert saw the princess weeping behind the bars of her prison window, he was reminded of his own little princess, whom he had left weeping on the nursery floor, and that made him call on the giant instantly to come out and be killed. The giant laughed a great laugh and came into the courtyard, not to be killed, but to kill the minstrel's son instead. But before he had time to do that, the minstrel's son had managed to kill him, and that was the end of the cruel old giant. "'That is the bravest deed I have ever seen done!' cried the princess when he fetched her out the dungeon. "'Brave deeds are easily done, then,' said deaf Robert, but he was glad indeed all the same to hear that he had done the first part of his task. The next thing he did was take the beautiful princess back to her own country, and that seemed to him a great waste of time, for he could not certainly do his own kind deed as long as he had the princess on his hands. But when they reached her country, and the princess told her father how deaf Robert had come out of his way to bring her home, the old king was pleased, and asked him what reward he would like for his trouble. For, he said, you have done the kindest deed any one could possibly think of. No reward for me, laughed deaf Robert, for there is my kind deed done, without my knowing it. And off he set once more on his travels. After that, the minstrel's son wandered about for a great many days, for neither a wise nor a foolish deed could he find to do. Sometimes, when he thought he had been wise, the people told him he was cruel and drove him out of the country, and sometimes, when he was sure he had been foolish, they only praised him for his kindness. He grew tired and footsore, and his clothes became old and ragged, and he almost forgot that he had once been a marquis and playfellow-in-chief to a princess. But he never forgot how the little Prince Prunella had looked as she sat on the nursery floor and wept with sobs that he might not, that he was not able to hear. So two years passed away, and still he had not learned how to be a real boy. One day, as he walked along a country road, he came upon a girl driving cows. "'Why are you looking so sad?' she asked him. "'Because I left my princess crying in her nursery two years ago, and I have been away for her ever since.' answered the boy simply. The girl burst out laughing. Well, she exclaimed, that was a foolish thing to do. Foolish? shouted deaf Robert. Did you say foolish? To be sure I did, laughed the girl. Could anything be more foolish than to keep away from someone whom you want to be with? Then I will go back to her this instant, declared the minstrel's son. And that would be the wisest thing you could do, answered the girl, and she immediately disappeared, cows and all, which just shows that she must have been a wimp all the while. Well, said deaf Robert, there are my wise and my foolish deeds done together, and now I am a real boy. Then he set off homewards as fast as he could go, and although it had taken him two years to come away from home, it took him only two hours to get back again, so it is clear that the wimps had had a hand in that too. And just about tea time, he stood outside the nursery door in the palace of his own little princess. It is well to remember that the wimps had come to the christening of the minstrel's son, otherwise it might seem a little wonderful that the princess Prunella should have pricked her finger again on the very day that her playfellow and chief came back to her. Anyhow, that is what happened, and, as the minstrel's son stood outside the door and listened, he heard the softest and sweetest and the prettiest sound he had ever heard in his life. Hurrah! he cried. At last I can hear the princess cry! And he burst open the door and ran into the room, all in his rags and his tatters, and knelt down to comfort the king's daughter. Oh, look at my finger, wept Princess Brunella as she showed him her little hand. Truly it was impossible to tell which of her small white fingers the princess had pricked, but as the minstrel's son kissed every one of them in turn, it is clear that he must have healed the right one, and that, of course, was why the princess stopped crying at once. Then she looked at her old playfellow, and laughed for joy to see him there again. 
The wonderful look has come back into your face, she said, but it is ever so much more wonderful than before. Dear little playfellow, whispered the Brinstral's son, I can hear the forest sounds again too, but you were right all the time, and the sounds of the town are much more charming than the sounds of the forest. Oh no, declared the princess, there you are quite mistaken, for the sounds of the forest are more beautiful by far, and it is a fact that they have been disputing the point ever since. End of The Tears of Princess Brunella from The Other Side of the Sun Storybook by Evelyn Sharp Reading by Blakeney Clark Uncle Wiggily's Lemonade Stand by Howard R. Garris This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. One day, as Nurse Jane Fuzzy Wuzzy opened the kitchen door in the hollow stump bungalow, she saw Uncle Wiggily squeezing juice from a lemon. Oh, Wiggily, are you making a lemon pie? asked the muskrat lady. Just then, some of the sour juice squirted in her eye, and she squirmed like an angleworm. I guess I made a mistake that time, sadly said the bunny, but I am trying to make lemonade. After Uncle Wiggily had helped Nurse Jane wipe the lemon juice out of her eye with a towel, the muskrat lady asked, Why are you making lemonade, Uncle Wiggily? The bunny gentleman said that some of the animal children wanted to start a lemonade stamp so they could sell cool drinks on hot days and give the money to the fresh air fund for poor animal children. So the stand was started. Uncle Wiggily helped Nanny the girl goat and Curly the pig to make lemonade to sell from a street stand. The first customer was Mr. Stubtail, the bear gentleman. Nanny handed him a glass, and when no one was looking, the piggy boy took some lemonade. I'm not saying that was right, though. We hope you like our lemonade, Mr. Stubtail, said Nanny. Please bring Nettie and Becky to our stand. I'll drink this lemonade, said Mr. Stubtail, and then I'll go get Nettie and Becky and treat them. He put the glass to his lips, but no sooner had he taken a sip than he dropped the glass and roared, Oh! Uh, uh, uh. Uncle Wiggily wanted to know what was the matter, and Nanny and the Piggy Boy were surprised. Too sour, too sour, howled Mr. Stubtail. I like sweet lemonade. Nanny ran into Uncle Wiggily's bungalow and brought out some sugar, which she poured into the lemonade while the piggy boy stirred it round and round. I guess this will be all right for our next customer, spoke Uncle Wiggily. Soon, along came Curly's father, Mr. Twistytail. He tasted some of the fresh air lemonade. Mo bunk, he grunted. It's quite too sweet. I like lemonade sour. Our customers are getting mixed in our lemonade, said Uncle Wiggily to Nanny and Curly, as he sent them to the store to get more lemons. I'll mark each pail, so I'll know which is sweet and which is sour lemonade. So the bunny marked a large S on one pail to show it was sweet, and he marked a large S on the other pail to show that it was sour. Now, everything will be fine, said the bunny. All at once, Uncle Wiggily happened to think that just the letters on the pails weren't enough. I can't tell sweet from sour, as each begins with the letter S, said the bunny. I wonder what I'd better do. Just then, the bad fuzzy fox and the worse woozy wolf sprang out of the bushes. You'd better keep still while we nibble your ears, they howled. First, 
have some lemonade invited the rabbit what kind of lemonade have you barked the fox looking hungrily at uncle wiggily's ears both kinds sweet and sour replied the bunny then i'll take both kind mixed chuckled the fox trying to be funny one kind will be enough for you and it doesn't make any difference what kind cried uncle wiggily and he threw the whole pail full of sour lemonade over the bad fox oh wow what does this mean barked the fox it means that i am tired of having you make fun of my lemonade cried the bunny and i'm tired of waiting for your ears howled the wolf as the fox ran away it's time you made a home run also mr wolf chuckled the bunny then he threw pale lemonade and all at the wolf who ran away also and more lemonade was made for the children End of Uncle Wiggily's Lemonade Stand by Howard R. Garris Read by Nemo Uncle Wiggily's Queer Umbrellas by Howard R. Garris This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Uncle Wiggily hopped out one day to have an adventure, and, as it looked cloudy when he started, he took his umbrella. The rabbit gentleman had not hopped very long before it began to April shower. I'll just hoist my umbrella, said the bunny. He was going along when he noticed Aunt Letty, the goat lady, without an umbrella oh please take mine begged the bunny i'd like to get wet oh thank you bleated aunt letty but can't we both walk under this umbrella uncle wiggily said no as he wasn't going her way the bunny was getting quite wet when up hopped mr croaker here is a large toadstool for you uncle wiggily grunted mr croaker you may use that for an umbrella i am used to the rain uncle wiggily thanked the toad and looked at mrs twistytail uncle wiggily had not been under the toadstool umbrella very long before mrs twistytail the pig lady came along with nothing to keep the april showers off her new bonnet oh please take this toadstool begged the rabbit uncle i don't need it mrs twistytail said he was very kind and invited him to walk under it with her but he was going the other way i like to get wet he said politely uncle wiggily hopped along in the rain without an umbrella when all of a sudden he heard a voice say quack 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 come over here mr longears and i'll give you a japanese parasol we don't need we ducks just live in the water the bunny thanked mrs wibblewobble just as uncle wiggily raised the paper umbrella which kept off the rain along came mrs cluck cluck the hen oh please mrs cluck cluck take this japanese parasol that mrs wibblewobble loaned me cried uncle wiggily to the hen lady when he saw she was getting all wet oh but i'll be robbing you cackled mrs cluck cluck nonsense laughed uncle wiggily i don't mind april showers besides maybe i can get under the pan with this kind dog i see coming along keep dry mrs cluck cluck oh uncle wiggily barked the ragged but polite tramp dog it won't do for you to get wet take my umbrella i made it out of an old dishpan i found and a broomstick it will keep you dry as for me i'll stand out in the rain and wash my clothes that way uncle wiggily thanked the tramp dog and just then the bunny saw mrs bushytail the squirrel lady coming 
I must help her, he thought. Uncle Wiggily had no sooner stepped under the pan umbrella than along came Mrs. Bushytail. The squirrel lady was getting all wet. Oh, my dear Mrs. Bushytail, cried Uncle Wiggily, pray allow me. This isn't a stylish umbrella, but it will keep off the wet. And the bunny stood in the April shower as Mrs. Bushytail scrambled off. Then, out of his house, with some pancakes, came Mr. Stubtail, the nice bear. Look here, Uncle Wiggily, said Mr. Stubtail. There's no need of you getting wet. Here are some very tough pancakes my wife made. I can't eat them. Rain won't hurt them. Fasten them on a stick, and they'll keep off the rain. The bunny, thanking the bear, did this, and Uncle Wiggily was hopping along through the rain with his pancake umbrella, when out popped the skillery scalery alligator. Wait a minute, grunted the alligator. Oh, no, answered Uncle Wiggily. I know what you want. My ears. The gator growled. Well, I'm so hungry I must eat something. Stand still until I get to you. But Uncle Wiggily wouldn't do that. Here, nibble some of Mrs. Stubtail's griddle cakes, he cried. They are so tough, you can chew on them for a week, and I can get away. Then the sun came out. End of Uncle Wiggily's Queer Umbrellas by Howard R. Garris Read by Nemo Uncle Wiggily Squirt Gun by Howard R. Garris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. One day, when Uncle Wiggily was out early to see the sun rise, he passed a rocky ledge from which hung many icicles. As the sun shone on the sticks of ice, they turned all the colors of the rainbow. How wonderful, exclaimed the bunny. Who made them? A little chap beside him said, I did. I am Jack Frost, and because you have been kind to me, I'll give you the power to make icicles. Whenever you wish to make icicles, Jack Frost told Uncle Wiggily, just push the squirt gun. Out will come water, and by magic power, it will freeze into icicles. The bunny thought this would be fine, so he hopped through the woods. Soon he came to a deep ravine he wished to cross, but there was no bridge, and it was a long way around. I'll try Jack Frost's trick now, said Uncle Wiggily. Out of the magic Jack Frost gun squirted water. It fell and froze, making a bridge of icicles across the gully. Ha! This is just fine, laughed Uncle Wiggily, crossing the ice bridge. He did not see the bad fox looking after him. What game is that rabbit up to now? growled the fox. I must follow and see. He has made a bridge where there was none before. I can cross after him and catch him. Having crossed the icicle bridge, Uncle Wiggily kept on until he came to the home of Uncle Butter the Goat. Help me down, Uncle Wiggily, he bleated. I was mending a leak in my roof, and the old fox came along and took my ladder. The bunny said he would help his friend, and pointed the squirt gun. Oh, I said help me, not shoot me, cried Uncle Butter, and Mr. Longears just laughed. I'm not going to shoot you, said Uncle Wiggily. This is Jack Frost's magic icicle gun. I'll make a ladder for you. So the bunny did, and the goat gentleman came safely down. The bad old fox, who had stolen the ladder away, thinking it would help him catch Uncle Wiggily, peeked around the corner. I wonder how I can get that rabbit, thought the fox, as the bunny was about to hop on. After having helped Uncle Wiggily down off the roof, 
the bunny traveled on with a magic jack frost squirt gun soon he came to where mrs twistytail the pig lady lived oh such trouble squealed the pig lady my clothes sticks are gone and all my nice clean clothes will sag down in the dirt uncle wiggily made ready the gun i'll freeze some icicle clothes sticks for you mrs twistytail he said icicle clothes sticks i never heard of such things squealed floppy the little piggy chap who is using the rake to help his mother hold up the line it can't be done declared curly i'll show you laughed uncle wiggily he squirted three or four streams of water up in the air when the water froze it turned into icicles and the pig lady used them to hold up the sagging lines having done a kind act for mrs twistytail by making icicle clothes sticks uncle wiggily hopped along he was tramping through the woods when all of a sudden the bad fuzzy fox ran out from behind a bush now i have you he howled you can't get away uncle wiggily pointed his magic gun ha ha i'm not afraid of a bit of water snickered the fox you can't do anything all of a sudden uncle wiggily began to squirt streams of water from jack frost's magic gun up and down the bunny made icicles in the air their ends resting on the ground until he had made a cage with bars of ice all about the fox let's see you get me now laughed the bunny as he started for his bungalow fooled again howled the fox who would think he could freeze me in like this end of uncle wiggily's squirt gun by howard r garris read by nemo